Welcome, welcome to Defending the Faith. Uh, we're continuing in uh, episode two of our subject, the Bible. You can go back on my YouTube channel at Stephen Sage, Stephen with a PH, and you can find uh, the episode one. And you can email me at sage725 at Yahoo, or go to Facebook. There is a page and a community called The Apologist. Uh, like I told people last week, uh, if you send me an email at sage725 at Yahoo and say, I would like to enter the drawing, you have up until July 20th of this year, 2022, and I'm going to draw some names and send this book to you if you win, The New Dictionary of Theology, Historical and Systematic. It's all in alphabetical order. It's a cool reference book, and uh, I'll get one out to you. If you uh, send me an email before July 20th, uh, it'll end midnight on July 20th. I'll stop taking emails at, at Sage725 at Yahoo, and just say, I'd like to enter the drawing, and we'll take care of that. Uh, we talked about last week about uh, what, what the syllabus is, what, the, what these are going to talk about in, the, in this, uh, what, we call, what, we're gonna, what we call the transmission and translation of the Bible. Now, why is it, why, the Bible, of course, uh, is, has been a, a controversial book. It's also the largest selling book of all time, and it will continue to stay that way probably until the rapture, and then they'll probably sell it, it, what they don't burn after, after that. Uh, and you won't be able to buy it anyways, but you may find some uh, somewhere in some rubble. But why is it important? It, it says it's the Word of God. We believe it because it's the Word of God. Therefore, we base our life on it, uh, the promises that are in it. I mean, that's why this book is so important. And uh, so... That's why me as a Christian, or maybe you, you're interested in knowing how we got the Bible, you know, and, and why there's so many different translations. And we're going to talk about a lot of that stuff during the course of this, uh, during the course of this. You know, last, last week uh, I, had showed a, I showed a bunch of um, tr uh, the different, all the different translations, how many there are. And uh, w I remember when I first got saved, uh, one of the first ones I had, The Way. Now, this was 1976, and uh, there was a Bible bookstore over on uh, 95th Street, uh, just off of Pulaski, like two blocks uh, east of Pulaski. And uh, it was interesting. Look at 595, The Way. They made it this way, and it also came in a, in a blue cover, and uh, there was also the Living Bible. It was a green hardcover. And then, like, Reach Out, the Living New Testament. These are what we call paraphrases. We'll get into that because one of the things we talked about last week, we're going to talk about translation philosophies. And uh, if you're interested in following along, uh, I, I showed all the different types of uh, translations there were. Let me just, uh, again, because since I'm, I'm touching on this subject again, but you had like the King James, the New King James, the American Standard, the New American Standard. Man, look at all this list of all these different versions. And then we're going to talk about how come they're all like that, you know, because they use different text types from different families. And also the Greek text they use as their basis in the manuscripts. We'll talk about those things. But uh, uh, we'll get into uh, those kind of things. We won't touch on all the different versions. Some are only New Testament only, like the J.B. Phillips. Uh, we, we're not going to get into that. Some people use that. Um, if you're interested in the subject and you want to go a little bit deeper uh, and, and on your own and, and, and read, I appreciate that. Uh, Ron Rhodes is a good book, uh, The Complete Guide to Bible Translations. Uh, if you want to get hold of that, that's gonna, that'll be a real helpful thing. And uh, it, some of the deeper stuff that we get into, uh, uh, you might want to get like F.F. Uh, F. Bruce and J.I. Packer, Film Comfort, Carl F. H. Henry. I read a, uh, last week, I read a quote from him. The origin of the Bible. Uh, there's an updated version. This would be very interesting to have. As you can see, there's a bunch of that stuff. There's t tons of books on the subject. You can go to, go to YouTube and just put in how we got the Bible or Old Testament manuscripts, anything like that. And there are countless episodes that'll, that'll be extremely helpful. Um, and like last week, we, I gave you the syllogism, God cannot fail or err. And, because, and the Bible is God's word, and therefore the Bible cannot err or, or fail. And so it's important that we understand that, and we'll examine some of the, some of the things the skeptics and, and cynics say that, are, uh, that dispute the Scripture. Uh, hundreds of times in Scripture we read, Thus says the Lord. Now, some will call this circular reasoning, uh, and uh, normally circular reasoning is not a good, a good defense or a good argument to use unless, this, unless it happens to be true. Uh, and we, we use more than just circular reasoning. But I'm showing what the Bible 
self-authenticates itself. It declares itself to be the Word of God. Uh, it's similar to the edict that you'd often find uh, in the Old Testament uh, when uh, the prophet would say, thus says the Lord. It was understood if he was a bona fide prophet and the people would know it because God gave prophets the ability at the time to do miracles, just like he gave the apostles the ability to do miracles to authenticate whom they were. If someone, if someone came up and said, I'm a prophet, you could say to him, prove it, do a miracle, do something. Moses did miracles, Elijah, Elisha. Uh, so you, you could do miracles. God would do that to help authenticate who you were. Because if you're going to say, thus says the Lord, I want to know what you're saying is true. I want to know who you are. Deuteronomy 18.22 warns about false prophets. If someone prophesies something that doesn't come true, they are a false prophet. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and it's similar to what you found in the Middle Ages, you know, with King, Ar with King Richard or uh, uh, King James himself. In, in 1600s, uh, uh, when a king gave an edict, it was, thus saith the king. And you didn't question it, you didn't disobey it, you didn't disregard it, you did it, or you'd go home without a head. And so uh, it's the same type of thing. That's how, that's how serious humans at that time took the person who was the king. Well, the Bible, and in reality, imagine how important it is when thus says the Lord. Okay? It's an edict that could not be challenged, questioned, and certainly not disobeyed in any way. A prophet saying such a thing, uh, he, he they were speaking on behalf of the very Almighty God Himself. They are claiming that the very words that they are speaking are the very authoritative words of God Himself. What a prophet said, God said. And so, and you find all through the history of the Old Testament, whether, you know, you got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Eze Jeremiah, Ezekiel, these guys who came forth and spoke on behalf of God because God was directing his chosen people. And so, and that's one of the things the Bible does. It shows us the history from Genesis to Revelation of God originally dealing with his chosen people, the Jew. And it was important. And, you know, because a lot of people bring up, oh, look how this God was. And you, you read a Le Leviticus and Deuteronomy and all this other stuff. You can't wear this. You can't eat that. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, this was, these were directives given to the Jew, not all of humanity, mm -hmm. to God's chosen people. Now, why is, because through all, all 66 books of the Bible, the fact is, there is a common thread that goes through the entire Bible. And when you look deeper and find out, it's Jesus Christ. From Genesis chapter 3 all the way to the end of Revelation. It's the revelation that's coming along of Jesus Christ who is going to come and redeem mankind from the actions of the first two human beings who chose to be disobedient and brought sin and death into the world. So all through, all through the Bible, there's this thread. It's Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the Savior that was, that, and the Deliverer that was prophesied in, in Genesis 3. And so, and we find that unveil as we go along. We find this unveiling as we go along. That's why God put some, some of the strict things on the Jews as he did. He had to keep this lineage pure. Because as this lineage is coming along, what he's doing is preparing the lineage. And if you read the beginnings of, uh, uh, in Matthew, the lineage that goes on there, uh, the Jews were very adept. They were sticklers when it came to keeping lineages and who's of this tribe and this and that, you know, the 12 tribes. And, uh, you know, he begot, he begot him, he begot him, he begot him. The, they got lists this long. It's a big deal to them. And God, God superintended that because to keep knowledge coming along because, remember, the tribe... The, uh, the, the, lion of, uh, the Lion of Judah would come from the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ, who would be the Savior. And so the lineage is kept, they kept very strict records, and God saw to it that it was kept. So that it, when, when Jesus, because it was prophesied who, where he'd come from, you know, and everything else, and so then it, could, it would be verified when he was born. You could look back and see all these steps that led up and all these prophecies that were made. Don't forget when Jesus was born, just his birth and, and life on this earth and his death, and, death uh, and dying on the cross and his death and resurrection, when he came, he fulfilled over 200 prophecies by his, by his birth. 200 prophecies, some made between 400 and 1500 years before he was born. This is one of the identifying marks of the Word of God. 
Uh, this could not be just a secular book or just a fairy tale. There is evidence in Scripture to verify the faith and the trust that we put in the Word of God. So uh, uh, he comes along and he's born and he fulfills all these prophecies. Now, besides uh, the proof text that, that goes with that, it also gives me the, the assurance that the remaining pro prophecies are going to be fulfilled as well. See, that's the thing about the Bible. It's historically correct, you know, and that's a good thing. It's historically correct. However, uh, any, any good writer, any historian can put a lot of uh, time in, a lot of investigation, right? And, and write a book that's historically correct. But the Bible's historically correct. It's also geographically correct. It talks about places that existed uh, a thou, a thou, over a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. And I talked last week about there are some, some that we didn't have any evidence, like the land of Shinar and other places, and I'll talk more about this when we get into the Old Testament, that the cynics said, look, it, it says this existed. There's no evidence. Uh, that's one of the things we talk about the Book of Mormon. It talks about all kinds of stuff. That there is no evidence. They won't even dig up in, in Palmyra, in, in, what's it, Palmyra? Yeah, uh, in New York. They won't even dig because they could prove themselves, but they don't. Uh, but it's, 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 it's not historically correct, the Book of Mormon. Not at all. Matter of fact, they talk about things that were supposedly in existence, that uh, alloys and animals that were here in, in North America. They weren't. We know from history they weren't. But the Bible is historically correct, it's geographically correct. There have been discoveries, archaeological, uh, archaeological discoveries that now reveal the things that the cynics said prove the Bible doesn't exist. So those two, but those two things, and a human who really does, who's a writer or uh, anything, he could really come up with, with, with doing a, a, a perfect uh, historical or geographical account of stuff, or very, very close to it. But there's one, so those two things show about Scripture and its truthfulness. But there's that one thing that I just talked about, that no other book, and dispels the fact that these things that themselves could just be human, humanly done prophetically. When you have things that are being talked about 400 to 1,500 years before they happen, you have met two men, Cyrus and, an, and another guy, who are named 100, 200 years before they're even born, these people were named. In Daniel chapter 9, you have, you have a, a, a prophecy that talks about as soon as the temple was starting to be rebuilt, that 483 years later, or whatever it was, uh, forgive me because I don't have that in front of me, uh, the exact date, uh, but exact, to the exact date, it said that the king would ride in. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey to the very day from when it talks about it in Daniel chapter 9. So, prophetically, it's correct. That's the, that is like, that's the, what's the word I want? The icing on the cake. It's the icing on the cake. No human being could possibly have a couple hundred prophecies already come true, and of course there'll be hundreds more to come true. To be so exact and right on. You know, you could, people want to talk about Nostradamus and other people, or you go see a fortune teller or this or that. I, can, I forget some of those women who were really popular in the 60s. There, there was a couple, at least one, I can't think of her name. You know, she'd been on Tonight Show and stuff, who was a who, who, fortune teller, tell the future. Uh, she, she wasn't right all the time. Matter of fact, she was wrong most of the time. Uh, that, and I mentioned Deuteronomy 18, you know, 19 through 22. That, that's, there's the key for a prophet, a true prophet does not err. A false prophet prophesies something that doesn't come true. You know, the, the, uh, the thing that always tells a prophet, uh, whether he's true or false, there's, he has one thing against him, and that is time. Time. Because if you prophesy something that's supposed to happen at a certain time, and it doesn't, you are a false prophet. The prophets who spoke the word of God never erred in their prophecies. That is a sign of a true prophet called by the Almighty God to speak on his behalf. So, getting back to uh, over here, what should be our response to the Word of God? As we talk about the Bible, we should believe it. In John 6, uh, it talks about that we should believe the Word of God, that we should love it. In Psalm 119, that's why we're doing this. We love the Bible. 
you know, I got, there are Christians on the other side of that camera. You're sitting somewhere, you're watching this. I hopefully you find it interesting because why? You love the Lord. You are his family. In John 1, 12, you've been called his, you're his child. You've received Christ. This should interest you. Like family stuff should interest us. Whether it's our family that we live with here on this earth or whether our spiritual family and our creator and our heavenly father, it should interest us. We should fight for it. Jude 3, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within you. Uh, we should fight for it uh, and we should study it, 2 Timothy 2.15, and rightly divide it. You know, you're gonna, it, takes, it takes a while to read and start to learn stuff. And the thing about the Word of God, it's eternal. So I don't, I've talked to men, been saved 70 years and have been studying the Bible for 70 years. And they're amazed at how little they know. Because why? God is an infinite being. His Word is infinite. You can just keep studying and learning and getting new stuff out of it for eternity. Man, it's awesome, isn't it? We should preach it. 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach it in season and out of season. That's what we should do with the Bible. We should hide it in our heart in Psalm 119, 11. We hide the Word of God in our heart because we love Him and we want to keep it right where uh, the very essence of our being so that we live it. Not just, not just read it but live it. Paul told Timothy, don't be just a hearer of the word, but be a doer of it. If you just hear it and, and gain knowledge, and, and what do you, you start using it to beat people up and become pedantic and your pride and everything else, but you want to live it. You want to learn it so that you can live it, not just know it. There's a difference between reading the word and knowing it and, act, and actualization and actually living it to please the Lord. So we want to preach it, hide it in our heart. We want to guard it. 1 Timothy 6, 2, we want to obey it. 1 Timothy 2, 5, it's easy to get saved. Jesus did it all on the cross. It's another, so it's, it's one thing to be a believer. It's a free gift. You can receive Christ in your life and be born again. Your sins are forgiven. You'll go to heaven when you leave this planet. There's also being a disciple. And that's, that's a little deeper, isn't it? Disciple, of course, is a, simply means student or follower. It's, it's a little bit different when you have live the Word of God and put it into effect and, and be an example. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge in this world. It means that we have to separate ourselves from so, some stuff. You know, I was a drug addict for so long and uh, into the kinkier to sex, the happier I was and the more drugs I did. There's things that if I want to continue to walk in victory, I need to not get into. You know, it's like if you uh, were an alcoholic and you, you go to 12-step groups, you know, but I, you're going to go watch the football game at the bar. You know, that might not be the best place to do that. You don't have to necessarily drink, but I, why, why set that stuff right in front of you? Pretty soon you're going to be talking to people and not paying attention, and you're going to, hey, you know what, just one ain't going to hurt me. That's what happened to me when I got delivered from drugs. Uh, just one, I know, a couple years later, just one time ain't going to hurt. It did. It put, me on a, it put me on a path that led to me attempting suicide twice, being homeless. Uh, it destroyed my life for quite a few decades. So you, know, so you want to avoid those things that could open the door for you getting in trouble. So you want to obey the word, not just be a hearer of it. And you want to honor it, Job, 30, Job 23, 12. It's the word of God. This is vital stuff. This is important stuff. It, the Word of God is life. Jesus Christ, He said, I am the way, truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. He is life. And He gives life. If you, receive, you, you can receive Christ into your life, and the Holy Spirit will come in, regenerate you, and you will know that your sins are forgiven. Now, one of the things we do, because we're talking about the Bible, is that the Bible makes these statements and I choose to accept them. Now, I've had a spiritual experience, which you will have if you become born again. You'll, because the, 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 uh, the blinders will fall off your eyes. You'll now read the word, it'll make sense to you. You'll, you'll understand why you pray. You'll understand why you go to church, all that stuff will happen to you. This new life comes in. It talks about in 2 Corinthians 5. You are a new creation in Christ. But you still have to walk every day, you know, and, and, and keep yourself from the things that want to pollute and drag you back in. So you want to obey the Word. Now as we talk about the Bible, 
being God's word in 1 Corinthians 2, 13, which things we also speak, Paul's talking about, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. That's the Bible. It's God's directive to us. It's his, it's his written revelation to us. So we have Jesus, the living word, and we have the Bible, which is the written word, which itself, the Bible itself is life. It is food for my spirit. The, the, if I go without uh, indulging in it, I'll find myself getting kind of weak. We read it because it is spiritual nourishment. Once you get born again, your spirit gets renewed. Now you want to feed your spirit, man, and you want to grow in, in the Word of God. In 2 Peter in 1.22, For no prophecy, which is the Word of God, was ever made by an act of human will, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Now, of course, Peter's talking about the Old Testament prophets there. you got to remember, when, they're, when these guys are talking in the New Testament, when they're talking about Scripture, they're talking about the Old Testament. Um, there's a term in, 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 in uh, I'm going to read it. You know what I'll do? I think it's probably best if I just read it from Scripture. And I'm going to put these on because a lot of my friends are, are probably watching this and I don't want them to feel bad. So I, since they're all, they all got to do this, I'm going to do this. I'm going to read you a, a verse here that pertains to what we're talking about with the Bible, why it's important to us, what the purpose of it is, and uh, most, uh, most every Christian I know knows these verses because they're very important for us, and they, they delineate uh, what the Bible is for us. And it's uh, 2 Timothy, and it's 3.16, and it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable. So, God inspired, we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, theonustos is the Greek word, we're going to talk about it in a second. Uh, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So that's why uh, I just read about why the importance of scripture is. And uh, I just mentioned about this word called inspired because it's an important word. Every scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I just read that to you in 2 Timothy 3.16. And then in 2 Timothy 3.17, that the person dedicated to God may be capable and equipped for every good work. For every good work. Uh, his word contains, it contains his will. It contains the mind of God. What's important about the inspired, this is the key, what this word inspired when it talks about in, in 2 Timothy. It's the Greek word theonustos. All the writing is God breathed. God chose to use men. You know, I, I, people always, I get a kick out of that. Some, uh, some uh, cynics and opponents will say things like, yeah, but it's written by men. Well, yeah, it was. God chose to use men. Men know how to write. Men developed how to, you know, through God's, through the grace of God and Him giving them a brain to create things. Remember, we're made in the image of God. God creates. We, as His image, we also have the ability to create. I'm creating this right now. Not doing a very good job, but I, I, I create music. Maybe you, you work in a garden. You're creating. Um, but uh, he, he uh, creates. Um, he breeds. He uses these men to write the word. Now, yeah, he used men, yes. Would you believe it more if he used monkeys or a giraffe? He used men, but he superintended the writing. He breathed into them what to write, and yet he still let them use their human personalities and use their writing styles. You'll find it all throughout Scripture when you start to dig in deeper. You'll see Paul uses certain words that maybe some other... Matter of fact, Paul coins about 180 words himself in the New Testament. Think about that. Uh, uh, he, he, he got them from go to, uh, taking words out of the Old Testament, especially out of the, the Septuagint. 
uh, arsenic, arsenic uh, kinote, uh, other words that he, that he coined together using two other Hebrew words and he compounds them into some Greek word. So you'll find that. But so and he was a scholarly man. That's why he did stuff like that. As opposed to someone who was like Peter, these guys were like kind of basic, you know, hoi polloi fishermen uh, struggling to get by. Uh, uh, Paul was more scholarly, more learned, more, ed more educated. But um, the fact is, is that he, God used their abilities, but the very words that he, he, he superintended to make sure the words that he wanted were put down and they're infallible and they're inerrant. You hear those words? Infallible and inerrant. Now, hear, hear this. In the original documents. And we'll get into that in Scripture because it's important. Today, we have a text, now, because don't forget, we have, we have looked at we, what text, textual criticism does is look at all of the available manuscripts and stuff and then puts them together and comes up with, we say the Bible. We have a text today that is 98.9% .9 pure. That's how close we are to the original, the original autographs. But it's only the original autographs that are inerrant and infallible. Only them. So, and, and otherwise, if all, every, all, all translations were, then this would be 100% text, wouldn't it? It's not. But 98.9%, 98, 98 that's really good. And this little bit that it's off from 100% has nothing to do with doctrine. These are small little uh, uh, manuscript discrepancies, variants we call them in textual criticism. They are variants. But none of, none of the variants... In all of the different families, whether it's the Alexandrian, the Byzantine, the Western text, these variants are insignificant pretty much. And there's a lot of them. There's like 400,000. Think about that. But there's, and now that sounds like tremendous amount. How can you say this is accurate when there's 400,000 variants? Because the overwhelming vast majority of them, matter of fact, just, just short of 1% or 2% are all variants that are insignificant whether it's a spelling of a word or other things. And we'll get, we'll get into that a little bit when we talk about textual criticism as the scribes over the years, you know, sit and do this task of, of you know, you can imagine humans make mistakes. The thing that enables us to come to this kind of, uh, of consistency is the fact that we have so much variety to look at. That's something that no other religion has. The Quran doesn't have that. This helps. God did this on purpose with all these families because we can look at all the varieties of texts, you know, and we'll get into that next week when we come back because we're out of time right now. Thank you very much for joining us. This is episode two about the Bible, transmission and translation. The Lord keep you and remember, the more you trust him, the more you'll find out how trustworthy he is. Thank you. Whatever happens, I'll give thanks to you. Whatever happens, I know your love will see me through. I offer my heart, seem the very least I can do. Do you?